Hello, the machine that changed the world. England's Northwest has its fair share of big hitters when it comes to the history of the computer. Not least Kilburn and Williams, the men who actually built this, the world's first computer. But there are other players, more recent players, and some whose work impacts on creativity and the arts. None more so than a man who died earlier this year, grieved, mourned by the entire digital community in the Northwest. He was a hero and a new media visionary. His name is Roy Stringer. I mean, he didn't come from a, a conventional background at all. I think he used to be a fireman. He had no kind of formal qualifications whatsoever. But he just had this incredible creative energy. Roy's enthusiasm for, for life, for people, um, and for ideas was what made him such a fantastic character. He was a great believer, fundamental believer in the power of technology to give people opportunities that they would never have dreamed of before. Absolutely anyone should be able to do this in the same way that anyone can write a script for a movie. You don't have to be a technician, you don't have to be a programmer, you don't have to be a graphic designer or an animator. You should be able to do this simply by having something to say and knowing what the form is. Roy was born in 1957 in Liverpool. He went to Anfield Comprehensive and did not do well. He left early. From being a fireman, he got a job as an Apple computer salesman. He had access to the machines he was selling, and these machines would open up a new world for him. He would go on then to open up their world. He was the first designer to incorporate moving images into a computer interface. His graphics made sense of Stephen Hawking's space-time physics. He believed that the computer needed new approaches, not just the past revamped. Roy Stringer consistently thought new. He won a number of international prizes, but Stringer's real achievement was that his vision and enthusiasm touched everyone who worked with him, changed them, energized them. Artist, yes, a new kind of artist for a new kind of world. At the moment, when we talk about art, we talk about a very specific set of things that are quite culturally specific. Um, and I think there are a whole range of things beyond that, which are also art, which are excluded from that. Um, I don't necessarily feel it's important for those things to be um, sanctioned by, by that kind of mainstream art world. Uh, I think it's much more important for us to kind of broaden our recognition of what we think is art, what we think is genuinely creative, so that people can actually feel a much greater sense of ownership over those things. Any use of a media which forces us to confront our conservative notions about what anything like art might be, uh, its place within our society, its role and function, how we educate people via it, how we sustain our very prejudices by looking at it, any kind of form of creative activity that makes us reassess and think about those issues rethink our identities, rethink our relationships with each other, is art. The problem when you discover a new world is that you use old words to describe them. With new media, um, it's like terms like uh, the new forest. Um, you know, you know, the new forest is now a forest that's kind of like 900 years old. Um, it's now no longer new. Um, with new media, it may well be that in 10 years' time, we're actually talking about new media, but what we're talking about is the use of computers to make art or the use of computers to, to do design or whatever, and there'll be something else that people are using that will call something else. When the car came along, it was the horseless carriage. The great German thinker Walter Benjamin pointed out that technology could provide all kinds of utopian futures for us, but it was all tied back by having to re-repeat and regurgitate the old. Then you have metaphors like web page, which focus us and make us see something in a very traditional manner. So you get all those boring arguments about CD-ROM or the web is the book dead. It's an irrelevant answer, you use them in different ways. What made Stringer interesting was was he was somebody who was more than willing to go out on a limb to challenge those notions and to make other people challenge those notions themselves by interacting with his work. When it comes to websites and CD-ROMs, we're still just filming the play. Let me explain what I mean. Back in the 19th century, they invented cinema. 
moving pictures. It was all about drama and comedy, so they had the act going on and they filmed the play. Twenty odd years later, a Russian called Eisenstein put in a close-up, cut it in, oh my God, that cinema. The same goes for the internet. I'm not saying that Stringer is Eisenstein, but damn close. I was just fascinated by the idea of manipulable pictures. And so I taught myself how to realize the ideas that I was imagining already. So I, I guess to that end, I was inventing my own form of interactive multimedia. And that's back in 1988. He, he was quite good friends with somebody called Ted Nelson. And Ted Nelson um, is, is one of these kind of computer gurus from the 60s. He wrote a book called Computer Lib. And he invented a lot of the kind of significant language that we use to talk about computers now. He invented the term hypertext. Um, and Ted came to speak at a conference here in Liverpool um, a few years back. And he, he kind of stood up in the, in, in the conference and said that um, the only person who's actually making multimedia in the world today is Roy, that most of the rest of us are simply using computers as paper simulators, in, in that what we're doing is we're just translating real-world tasks into the computer, and we're not really using the computer for what the computer can do. Let's get real. Here's the before and after. This is a bunch of stuff in a computer. Files. How do you present it? An alphabetical list? One under another? Why? Because that's how books did it. This is how Roy Stringer does it. The Navihedron, of which more later. Again, a bunch of things inside a computer, but the way you find them, open them, sort them, is drawn from the possibilities of cyberspace, not the habits of a past millennium. That's what Roy was about. It wasn't about the technology. You know, Roy was not actually driven by the technology at all. The technology, he manipulated the technology to do what he wanted. And, and really, the, the whole thing about designing intuitive and user-friendly interfaces, that was his, his aim. We all use television but none of us know how it works. Um, at the moment, if you use a computer, you kind of have to know how it works in order to get something out of it. So we haven't actually got them to do precisely what we want, what we need them to do. And to some extent, that's the tools actually getting more sophisticated so that they're better at doing it. But it's also to do with us learning how to use them better so that we can actually communicate what we want to do with those tools more effectively. Multimedia does its stuff best when it's physically tactile. Asking a computer screen to be a book is a dumb idea. What Roy Stringer is about is the interface. Funny word, it means how you and I experience and control what's going on in the valves or the solid state memories. The world's first interface was this, a cathode ray tube with 2,048 spots. These days, we have GUI. Once upon a time, you connected with a computer via a punch card. Come the 70s, instructions were typed via a keyboard. Glowing, ugly green letters. Xerox, the photocopier company, took life seriously. Their researchers invented things, like a mouse that clicked on pictures on the screen. The graphic user interface, GUI, was born. Xerox, however, didn't think much of the inventions, and they didn't even patent them. Hello, the Apple Mac. Hello, Windows. The future was born, and for some people, that was just the beginning. He wasn't constrained by anything that had been before. Um, the bits I've seen, he doesn't seem to like hierarchical indexes, does no, he? No, really? not at all. Because he, he thinks that is a very constrained way of almost dictating to people how they should um, you know, navigate around an environment and really what the digital media enables people to do as opposed to any other traditional media is to really um, access information and content from their own individual perspective. Wendy is talking navigation. Roy Stringer invented the Navihedron. This is one of the three-dimensional objects that got Roy very, very excited because he saw potential for this to be used in navigation. One of the most troubling things in the world of the internet is finding your way around. You've got the equivalent of the British Library available to you. That's the good news. The bad news is all the books are all over the floor and someone switched the lights out. So finding what you want 
is actually quite difficult. The first time Wendy Stonefield heard about the navihedron was when she was being interviewed for a job by Roy Stringer. What he did is he started describing his concept of the navihedron um, to me and about how you know people have really not been very innovative in, in new media in terms of how to really use its power to navigate around the digital environment in a different way. And that was the first time I met him, where he pulled out his navihedron structure and started explaining how to use a digital space to me. Did you understand it first time around? No. <laughs> I pretended to, though. <laughs> well, let's imagine that the space inside here is music. Now, there are different potential entry points to music now. We've not just got one label on a a menu that says music press here we've got labels on these points instead that say let's take um, resonance now if you have a scientific background and you're a, a, say a physicist maybe this is a natural starting point for you to enter the space of music resonance understanding how music travels through the air whereas across the other side of this object you've got the social impact of music and so if you're an anthropologist, maybe you'll start from over here. You're entering the same information space. It's exactly the same. It's just it feels much more natural to you. You're much more engaged because you're starting in a zone that you've already got some empathy with. Join us in part two for the game's revolution. The digital impulse in Liverpool only grows stronger. Next year we'll see the opening of FACT, the Foundation for Art and Creative Technology, Liverpool's first purpose-built arts venue since the Philharmonic Hall back in 1939. What's that going to be there? We're looking at effectively the back of the building. This is all kind of glazed on this side. But uh, what we've got on the ground floor, the major spaces are there's a large gallery. We're going to have a media lounge, an online presentation, DVD presentation. Okay. Uh, first floor, two more galleries. Yeah. Bar. Has to be a bar, Eddie. Absolutely. Have to have a bar. Yeah. Third floor, three cinemas. Fourth floor is our offices plus media labs where we're going to have artists working in residence and so on. The Fact Centre isn't a building that's been created because there's a gap in provision. It's grown and we've created the case, we've created the market for it. And that's hugely significant because that's pretty rare to get that. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're going to succeed. I think it's been very significant that there is a, there is a, a very particular and ve I think very special new media community and ecology that's that, uh, that has grown in Liverpool, that's evolved in the city, that is emerging out of a number of kind of key personalities who, who created their own space within that and their own identity. And, and, that's, and I think that's forged a very special place for Liverpool and one that's recognised nationally. But it will be connected to anywhere else where antibodies are referred to. By the way, guess who was chairman of the FACT board? Okay. Roy Stringer. That's he had the opportunity to work anywhere in the world and a lot of people approached him to work in, in some fantastic contexts and would have given him fantastic resources to work with. Again, I'm astonished at the fact that we've got three things that are... Hey! <laughs> hey, you! <laughs> Ultimately, Roy believed that um, there was something very special about the place that gave him his character, helped him forge his ideas. And you know, that, that's fantastic because I think that inspired a lot of people. He made a lot, he helped a lot of people stay here who would have, who would have wanted to relocate somewhere else for other reasons. And that inspiration was, was part of creating um, what we've got today in terms of the, the whole new and emerging media ecology. Let's check out a particular piece of Stringer work. A training aid for cervical cancer testing. And yes, he revolutionized it. Well, he went into the lab and just 
beavered around looking at what people were doing, found, came across this thing called the Papa Nicolau staining process, which is this... I won't even ask. Yes. Well, it's basically, you just, you have to stain the smears to, so that you can see what's, you can actually see the cells, because when they're first taken, you can't see anything down a microscope. So it's all done by a machine, locked away in a fume cupboard. No, you don't know what's happening, but if anything goes wrong at any stage, it can really fundamentally affect how the slide appears. So he deconstructed this, created this animation using multimedia so that you could see what the slide looked like at each stage of it being stained and showed this to the steering committee meeting and the doctors who were at that time just sitting on the steering committee went, God, that's amazing. They'd never seen anything like it and they, the whole potential of multimedia came alive in the project. He created this slider down here where you can literally pull through and right. change and your focal it's length. A focus. It's a focus pull. A focus pull wi yeah. within a visual. It was just um, a sort of one second's worth of video, 30 frames or something. Yeah. And then depending on where your mouse is, it moves the slider, it takes you to a different frame of the video. It's technically, actually, it's very simple to do, but conceptually, you, you think you're focusing. You, you, it gives you that yeah, sense sure, that you are actually moving through the cells. So you, you're using, it's the next best thing to using a microscope. Oh, fantastic. And change the focus brilliant, of the brilliant, cells. Brilliant. And there's more. Roy Stringer thinks, and the computer shows and tells. These are magnetic resonance images, um, where you can, like x-rays, but you can see the tissue as well as the bones. Yes. So we're and actually this looking... This is NMR, isn't it? That's right, okay, yeah. NMR, okay. And we're looking at down, you can see the red line here shows you we're looking basically at the right hip at the moment. And again, yes. we've got the slider to take us through the body. Oh, okay. And so by taking a set of 2D images, you can build up a 3D picture of the body from those selections of 2D images. This is another one which was uh, basically just a way of showing where the, the uterus is located in the body. Even some people in the medical field, when they first saw it, they thought, oh, it's, it's pointing the wrong way. I, that's what I thought. Because you only ever see static diagrams in books and where it's sort of lying flat and you don't get a 3D idea sure. of where it is within the body. But, uh, but that is anatomically correct. <laughs> Roy Stringer was a founder partner of Amaze, a Liverpool new media firm with more than 100 employees. A techie, a nerd, a visionary, a guru. Wrap it all together and do not deny the final word, an artist. I think a lot of what Stringer did was, was art, yeah. Um, in the sense that there are all kinds of challenges to medias. Rather than using the internet to just replicate, say, telephone and, and television uh, distribution and exchange, he wanted to always use them in new and unique forms, things which challenged the media as well and challenged our older notions. He was extremely passionate about, about the arts um, and about how you could bring together from the gaming side and um, you could bring together the best of that and use that to actually educate people um, in an e-learning environment. It's up to the person themselves to define themselves as being an artist, that, that you're, you're an artist when you feel like you're making art. Um, and I would, I would think Roy certainly felt that and I probably would support him in that. Roy Stringer died after extensive treatment for cancer in spring of this year, aged 44. To say he is gone but not forgotten is a monstrous understatement. His vision and his enthusiasm seem to live on in every person whose life he touched. I think he was just one of those people that he could drive you absolutely mad at one time, and yet he was so warm, so giving in many ways, and, uh, and just so creative, so full of energy. He was you know, such a bright spark, if you like, so inspirational. Liverpool has, has certainly kind of lost somebody who was, who, who was a champion um, for the area that he was working in. One of the difficulties in working in this area is, is how to make sense of it all, how to kind of understand things and how to kind of deal with the often sort of fairly petty problems that you come up against. And Roy was a good person to kind of turn to in those situations for, for solutions. Everybody whose lives he touched, he, he made a very big difference in whatever way, whether it was actually shaping their future by guiding them in a particular direction um, and involving them in things that they maybe would never have ever dreamt they'd be involved in. And I think he, he was a real people's person, Roy. His main legacy is that there are still an awful lot of people, particularly in the Northwest, particularly in the world of the arts, who can't think of new media without 
a little bald guy with a still recognisable Liverpoolian accent springing into their mind's eye saying, come on, you can do better than that. You can push it further. You can take it somewhere else. Thank you.